Okay, go ahead. So my name is Ondřej Chvála. I'm a postdoc at the Nuclear Engineering Department at University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And this August I will start as a research assistant professor in the department. And I'm interested in molten salt reactors for a long time, thanks to Kirk and others. Uh, how did you first hear about them? I don't really remember. I think it was in sometime in 2006 I stumbled upon the Energy from Thorium uh, discussion forum. And so I started to research uh, what is it all about using the books and the papers uh, which Kirk scanned from the uh, Oak Ridge library and I became interested I've, and so I've, I kept on researching the topic and I think it's a, the best game in town we have. Uh, what do you think those documents constitute? Like uh, in terms of people finding interest in it, do those documents kind of get things going or what, what got things going? So uh, the documents which Kirk scanned proved that this is a viable concept because it was done and it, it performed well and they, they solved a lot of uh, issues uh, during the program. So you could get actually credible evidence that this is not just a paper reactor uh, concept but that this is something which actually works. And when you start from that, uh, you realize that this is not just a one reactor, this is the whole class of, uh, of possibilities uh, which uh, which need to be explored and there is research going on right now in, in, in Europe, in Czech Republic, France and other places where uh, people are trying to, to pursue this with up-to-date uh, materials and uh, chemistry and uh, computational uh, techniques. So this uh, taken all together persuaded me personally that this is a credible way of uh, getting to the next generation of nuclear technology, which doesn't suffer many of the drawback drawbacks uh, that the current generation has. Um, I missed your talk. Oh. Uh, do you want to give me a, uh, I mean, obviously I'm going to watch it <laughs> during, during the editing process, but do you want to give me a recap of what, what you were talking about? Um, oh. Like, uh, don't say it as my talk was about blah, 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 but say, g give me a nutshell what, what the message you were trying to get across was. Okay, so I, I think the biggest issue we have in, in the West right now uh, when we think about building these reactors is that we don't have a lot of um, uh, credible experts or accredited experts, basically people who have advanced degrees in nuclear engineering and at the same time they have a research experience uh, from molten salt reactors so enough that, that they are well qualified to uh, talk about the subject and who are at the same time not retired. And these are the people who, whom the government would ask for opinion about this technology. So I think we need to train new generation of experts, uh, people who have uh, the proper qualification and the background, but who also have uh, the uh, required knowledge uh, and background in the molten, specifically molten salt reactors. Uh, to my best, the best of my knowledge, uh, molten salt reactors are not taught as a part of a reactor physics uh, curriculum in any nuclear engineering department in the United States and I would like to change that. I would like to develop an academic curriculum of uh, uh, lectures and uh, you know, example problems with solutions and homeworks and whatnot. Everything you need for uh, uh, academic course in molten salt reactors or modules which could plug into existing courses where you have a course on fuel cycle to mention what are the options with uh, uh, liquid fuel. If you have a course on reactor design, again, what, what would be the you know, molten salt reactor part, say one or two lectures just covering the molten salt reactors, which then could be used across the country or even across the English speaking world in the respective departments. To my knowledge, the only department which is actually teaching this as a part of the standard curriculum in uh, uh, reactor physics is in the Czech Technical University in, in Prague uh, and that's not enough especially not enough for the um, uh, United States. So the problem we have I think is that when, when politicians ask the, the question about uh, you know what do you think about molten salt reactors they find 
uh, people who are uh, experts in nuclear engineering, but since they do not have a uh, good background in molten salt technology, often they cannot really good give the decision makers good answer. And uh, we need these people uh, to develop these reactors, to operate them, to regulate them. So we need molten salt reactor experts at Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And we need these people to give uh, well-qualified answers to queries from uh, politicians, from industry, uh, from interested public, uh, journalists and other media. And I think this is uh, one of our biggest bottleneck that we were, have very few people who are uh, well qualified to, uh, who have the qualification to, good, to give good answers. I don't think we have more than a dozen, maybe two, of people like that in the United States. And I think this hampers our progress a lot. Of the two dozen people maybe qualified in this country to talk on this technology, uh, they're all here with us today at the conference. Like, no, I, I don't no, so. no, it's not. Oh, okay, no, that's good. Um, so, do you want to do you want to extrapolate then on the the problem of maybe the education system? Well, I think uh, if we don't educate uh, experts in nuclear engineering, who uh, understand molten salt reactor technology, then we will have a very hard time. Uh, developing these reactors, we will not have people to staff the companies which want to which want to push this technology forward. We will not have people who could uh, 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 regulate these reactors, who could create the, the necessary regulatory uh, environment for these reactors. We will not have people who could uh, persuade uh, the, the politicians, say the, the people who are at the uh, national laboratories, when the politicians ask them what should we uh, fund as a government what would be a, a good, good way of uh, solving issues of our country, then if we don't have these people, then we will not get, we will not have the good answers. And so we are sort of in a, in a, uh, sorry. So we have a chicken or egg issue that we can't get funded uh, research relevant to molten salt reactors because we don't have people um, at the government level uh, or people who advise to the government uh, who think that this is a good idea and one of the biggest reason is that they do not have experience with molten salt reactors and they do not understand the technology enough to, to make the judgment so basically we can't get funding to educate these people and then to do the research um, and if we can't do that that we will not have a people uh, are qualified enough to make this call. So we are sort of in a, in a bad loop here that we have very little um, uh, actual ex expertise. Like think about your talk and think about more points you want to get across, you know? Okay. At the university when you want to have a student work on a project, uh, you need to fund the project. And uh, the government doesn't fund, currently the US government uh, the U.S. Department of Energy doesn't fund any molten salt reactor related work. I think the big reason for it is that we have very few experts in the field who are active and who have a good uh, understanding of the molten salt reactor technology. So then we cannot get the funding for, uh, uh, for growing more experts for, uh, to teach this technology to young professionals because the old professionals don't think it's a good idea. And my belief is that large part of it is that uh, this technology was not thought for a long time and, and um, many people who actually have the experience are retired or dead. So we s need to bootstrap molten salt reactor re related education in this country if we want to uh, develop, build and license and operate these reactors. Are you one of those guys that kind of thinks about what the world's going to be like 50 years from today when stuff gets deployed? Um, so to quote Alvin Weinberg, uh, energy is the ultimate raw material, uh, which means that if you have uh, plentiful, affordable energy, you can do basically anything. You can desalinate water, you can purify water, uh, you can uh, create uh, carbon neutral fertilizers, uh, you can recycle uh, all the um, landfills, 
using plasma arc technology and basically separate the materials from the landfill for recycling. So uh, the problem is not that we are using too much energy. The problem is that we are the, the energy which we are using, we are producing it in an unsustainable manner. And with molten salt reactor technology, I believe uh, we could get this uh, affordable energy, which would be clean and would be plentiful for uh, any imaginable uh, time frame. If you imagine that we could increase the uh, resource utilization of uh, uranium, for instance, from the current 0.5% uh, uh, to 100%, which I believe is possible with uh, some type of molten salt reactors, then we could uh, have uh, 200 times higher prices for the fuel and still had the, the low fuel cost as we have now. So we could, uh, we could extract uranium from seawater uh, and without actually making the whole uh, technology uneconomi uneconomical uh, from the uh, fuel price perspective. And uh, you can make a little calculation how much energy you can extract if you fission the uranium which is in seawater and you realize that uh, powering something like 10 times the current energy consumption um, uh, you could power the, the sorry that if you could power the whole world energy consumption 10 times over for two billion years uh, on the uh, uranium in the seawater alone do you want to restate that last part again just because that was a really good point and you could power the whole uh, civilization energy needs 10 times over for 2 billion years on uranium from seawater alone. And we know what are the, um, what, what would be the, the price of extracting uranium from seawater. It was done in Japan in, in, in 90s and we have a good idea how this technology would work. It's a passive sorption uh, which is driven basically by solar energy because they use the, the, the ocean currents to kind of uh, run the uh, uh, the seawater through the, f the filters which just absor possibly absorb the uranium and we know that uh, within a few hundred thousand years this uh, planet will not be habitable anymore because the sun, bright, sun is getting brighter and brighter it's about 10% 10 per, 10 brighter per billion years it's the normal stellar evolution of a, a main sequence star so for, for the time scales for which uh, we have on this planet, we could uh, power it purely by fission, if we do the fission technology right. So there is no, uh, so we have enough energy, we just need to be smart about how we extract the energy to avoid producing uh, long-term waste and to, to, to use the resources we have efficiently. And I believe that molten salt reactor technology is a key to this. Okay, you want to do a distinction between lifter and uh, molten salt reactor? Like, may basically say uh, oh, why, why the molten salt reactor aspect of this is key. Uh, molten salt reactor is a reactor where the fuel is dissolved in uh, uh, halide salt. It can be fluoride salt or chloride salt. And uh, the fluoride could be bound with some... Uh, uh, with, with, with lithium, sodium, beryllium and other elements to create the... the <laughs> Sorry, I got distracted. <laughs> a reactor that uses liquid f fuel, and that's precisely what we have trouble developing here, right? The one thing that's the most important thing is exactly the one thing that we don't uh, have enough experts on. So molten salt reactor is a type of reactor where the fuel is dissolved in molten salt. Molten salt is a salt of uh, fluoride or chloride with uh, sodium, lithium, beryllium, or other uh, element on the other side of the periodic table and they create perfect medium for fission to take place in because they don't suffer radiation damage and because we can uh, we can extract fission products which would otherwise gobble neutrons from these salts while we are operating some of the fission products we can get out very easily because they are gases and they just bubble out you can sparge them with helium and this means that we don't have limits on burn up of the fuel. The fuel can stay in the reactor as long as the reactor can operate from the structural point of view of the, of the reactor. Uh, so we, do not, we can avoid creating uh, nuclear waste just by uh, recycling the usable fuels, which are the transuranic elements, back into the reactor core and by extracting just the fission products from 
the, the actual nuclear ashes from the reactor for other uses. Fission products, which are the real waste from uh, fission, are just split heavy uh, elements, split into lighter elements, and these are all rare materials with unique properties, which already have many applications in medicine industry and sanitation. And I'm sure that if we develop a um, way how to efficiently extract these materials, we will find many other uh, uses for these uh, fission products. Um, even if we don't use them for our benefit, if we just want to discard the fission products, then because they have much shorter lifetimes, the radiotoxicity of fission products is about three to 400 years instead of 250,000 years for the transuranic elements. So we, we, can, uh, we can turn the uh, quarter million year problem of geological repository with our current generation into a 300 year problem if we discard just the fission products. And I think everybody would believe that we can engineer a barrier which will last uh, 300 years. And all these uh, transuranic elements, the long-lived ones, the Neptunium, Plutonium, Americium, Curium, and so on, uh, they are usable fuels. It's just that, that it's very challenging to reuse them in a solid fuel form, but it's relatively easy to uh, utilize them as a fuel in a, in a liquid salt, because the, the liquid salt doesn't suffer radiation damage. Uh, liquid salt will not develop hotspots since the the volume of the reactor is homogenized on a time frame of uh, seconds. So, uh, and you are very insensitive to, you know, to, to what kind of isotopes uh, you put in the reactor. I mean, this is kind of in quotes, uh, at least compared to uh, the soil fuel reactor, where uh, if you make a mistake in your isotopic composition of a pellet or, or, or a fuel pin, it can ca cause a meltdown of, of the core and, and uh, be out of trouble, whereas in a molten salt reactor, these the fuel is homogenized, so uh, uh, it cannot develop the hotspots. What about uh, vortexes and stuff like that? You have to you have to design the, you have to design the reactor such that uh, uh, you will not get you will not have precipitation of uh, uh, some materials out of the out of the salt in a places where you wouldn't like it. So, I mean. Of course, this is all for well-designed uh, reactors. Any machine can be designed very badly, but with molten salt reactors, we have the, the option to design them well, and then they shouldn't suffer from from issue like this. And of course, this all has to be uh, tested and, uh, uh, and proven before we can go ahead with deploying these reactors. But I think there are all indications uh, that that this is this is well doable. Um, okay. Um, anything other ideas? We've, this camera is going to run out of fuel in nine minutes, so if you want to keep going for nine minutes, if you're comfy with that, then we can just use up this camera. Okay, any other questions? Uh, oh, maybe I'll switch off. If you're done, I'll switch off to John and try to soak okay. up these nine minutes. Okay. Are you good Dang, for nine? I'm such a jackass. No, it's okay. Yeah. I only got nine okay. minutes left on this camera, so let's use up the battery before. Yeah, sure. Thanks. You're welcome.